For those of you who are new to JTF, perhaps you've heard of the Templeton Prize before. It used to be an event that took place across the pond in the United Kingdom. And in that case, it was a beautiful event, but it felt a little far removed from, from our team for those of us who didn't go over to attend the prize ceremony on a regular basis. In recent years, we've been able to host the prize ceremony here in the United States, which has allowed many of you to actually come and attend the ceremony. And of course, this past year, everyone had the opportunity to participate from the comfort of your own home as we produced our first virtual Templeton Prize ceremony. Because the prize has taken a place abroad, we haven't had the opportunity for our entire team to interact with our laureates on a regular basis. And in fact, the last laureate to spend time with us was Jonathan, or Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in 2016. So Dr. Collins, we're very delighted. I know you prefer to be called Francis, so I'll refer to the, I'll change my, uh, my term in just a minute, but I, we're very grateful that you would spend time with us today. And as I thought about how to focus our conversation, and I will open it up to the rest of the team at the end of our conversation, I was reflecting on something that a colleague shared. This was a conversation between Ezra Klein, the author, and Ted Chang, the science fiction writer. And Ezra Klein asked him, what do you think the difference is between the scientist trying to understand the universe and the religious seeker trying to understand God through the workings of the universe? Ted Chang said, I think there's a strong similarity between what scientists are interested in and maybe what religious people are interested in. Many Renaissance scientists were profoundly religious, and they saw, they saw no conflict in that at all. For them, understanding how the universe worked was getting to know God better. And that's very similar to the same kind of experience that people of faith have when they think about their religious beliefs and practice. So with that in mind, I wanted to ask you about your work as a scientist, some of the discoveries you made and what that meant to you, some of the influences. We of course know you for your work on the Human Genome Project, your role as director of NIH and as the founder of BioLogos, which JTF has funded for many years, but your career extends far beyond these accomplishments. And I would love for you to share a story of one of your most awesome breakthroughs. And I use that word purposefully because science is awesome. But can you share a story of one of your most awesome breakthroughs or discoveries? What did you learn? What mistakes did you make along the way that led you to that great outcome? Wow, that's a great way to start the conversation. Heather, thank you for the kind invitation to come and join uh, this terrific group and to talk about science and faith in whatever way we uh, find it's gonna be uh, useful to go. I do want to express my sincere gratitude uh, to the John Templeton Foundation uh, for the awarding of this Templeton Prize. It was such an experience to get that word from you about a year ago and then to go through the process of planning how the, how the whole event would happen and the way in which uh, you put that together. The remarkable amount of uh, effort that went into uh, various videos was really quite amazing to be part of and hopefully we'll have kind of a longer lifetime than that uh, brief uh, hour or so event that we had at the National Academy. So many thanks to all of your staff for that. And again, thanks to the Templeton Foundation for the way in which you have supported BioLogos, which you have just mentioned as a foundation that I think has become a really good meeting place for people who are interested in talking more deeply about how Christian faith and rigorous science uh, can in fact get along well together and even complement each other and become uh, new ways of uh, seeing truth. And, and I don't think BioLogos really would have ever gotten off the ground or been sustained in such a wonderful way without your help. So really glad to recognize that as well. So uh, thinking about your question, what would be uh, the example? I have been fortunate as a scientist uh, to be engaged in those moments of discovery that really are just hard uh, to 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 overstate what that experience can be like. And of course, one should also say, those moments of discovery are separated by long periods of experimental frustrations, uh, failures of hypotheses, uh, you know, tubes that fell on the floor just at the point that you thought you were about to make some observation that was gonna matter. The life of the scientist is this really interesting uh, experience uh, of ups and downs. But the ups, when they happen, when you, when you discover something that wasn't known before, 
uh, and especially if it has relevance uh, to human flourishing, boy, those are hard to beat. So I will reflect on just one. It was a rainy night. <laughs> Sounds like a bad novel getting started. A, a rainy night in New Haven <laughs> in May of 1989. Uh, I was there at a genetics meeting, of course, <laughs> But my mind was not so much on the meeting. It was on the experiments going on that day uh, in my lab and in the laboratory of Dr. Lapchi Choi at the Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto. Because Lapchi's lab and my lab had two years earlier basically decided to merge our efforts. Uh, instead of being competitors, uh, we were just going to collaborate in the most transparent way possible to try to find the cause of cystic fibrosis. And I knew we were onto something that looked like it might finally be the answer after many frustrations and blind alleys. And that evening, as we finished our duties at the genetics meeting, uh, Lapchi and I went up to our rooms in the Yale dorm, because that's where we were staying. And he had in his room a fax machine that we had all agreed we were gonna put up in place so that data from the lab could be sent and we would find it uh, when we got loose uh, from our meeting responsibilities. And we opened the door uh, to his room and there was paper all over the floor. <laughs> I thought, okay, something's happened here. Uh, some of you are wondering, what, a fax machine? Why didn't you just email? Well, there wasn't email. <laughs> so this is how we communicated, imagine that. And we went, uh, picked up all those pieces of paper and began looking at them. And in the space of 15 or 20 minutes, it became clear to me that we had the answer. That this was uh, a conclusive genetic proof that a three base pair deletion in a previously unknown gene on chromosome seven was the cause of this recessive disorder that had taken so many lives prematurely and that we had been searching for, uh, for the preceding decade. And there it was. And that was, I'm getting chills talking about it. It was mm -hmm. a moment of exhilaration. It was a moment of awe. For me as a Christian, it was also a moment of thankfulness. And also this sense that I have as a scientist, who's also a person of faith, of having just a glimpse of God's mind that we have now understood something that God already knew. And we've been given the privilege through the tools of science uh, to understand this in a way that might ultimately help somebody. And now the responsibility, of course, is to figure out what to do with that in a way that will lead to that kind of future healing, which took another 25 years, really, before we got to the point of being able, as we now can say, that we have a therapeutic uh, approach to cystic fibrosis built directly on that discovery, on what we learned that May evening in 1989, that now means 90% of cis people with cystic fibrosis have a highly effective therapy that causes some of them to begin to plan for retirement instead of what they used to have to do. So that was a moment. Oh my gosh, hard to beat that one. <laughs> right, that's a great description. And I was gonna ask how long then did it take for therapies to be developed? And you answered that question. So it took some story. time, yeah. right? which you, you, of course there were mistakes along the way, I can imagine. And there were points of frustration. We put a lot of our effort right after that in trying to develop a gene therapy for cystic fibrosis. Okay, we got the gene, it affects the lungs. We'll just put the normal gene into a viral vector. We'll aerosolize it. People will take a deep breath and they'll be cured. <laughs> That was really naive uh, and many years uh, of frustration followed until it became clear that we really should think about other approaches, which ultimately succeeded, which were actually a more traditional drug development, not a gene therapy, but a small molecule drug. And that's what worked. We made a lot of other mistakes too. I guess one of the lessons though that I should really highlight is I mentioned that this was a an experience of merging my lab with another lab that really wasn't something that people did especially when you're in different institutions yeah. and yet i learned from that just how critical it can be when you're trying to go after a really hard hard target 
is to bring all of the talent around the same table and not worry too much about who's going to get the credit. Let's just figure out how to unleash all of that talent together. And that's what, uh, that's what made this possible. And I wanted to ask you a question about teams of scientists working together. And over your time, over your career, what have been the key characteristics that enable scientific teams to work together effectively? Is it sort of the character of the team members? Does it come down to the leader of the lab? Um, just your reflections on what goes into making these discoveries from the personnel perspective and the, the people, the actual people involved. Yeah, there are some lessons there because they don't always work, these team efforts. Uh, they certainly don't seem to work very well if they're like shotgun marriages <laughs> where you force uh, a couple of groups to get together who don't really want to. <laughs> That's not going to be sustainable. Well, first of all, you have to have a compelling goal that everybody can go, oh, wow, if you could do that, boy, I'd like to be part of the team that tried that. If, if it's just another sort of derivative, obvious next step, uh, people may not be that excited because they're going to have to give some stuff up in order to join a team of this sort. It might dilute the individual's ability to say, I did this, and instead it's going to be, we did this. I think about this with the Human Genome Project, which ultimately was a team of 2,400 scientists in six laboratories, uh, six countries, 20 laboratories. And my job was to coordinate all of that and to keep everybody uh, focused on the same goals with the same standards uh, of uh, data quality and data release. And there were moments uh, where that was pretty tough because people who had been used to running their own show kind of forgot <laughs> that that's not how it works when you have a team of this sort. And yeah, I, I guess I did some of those woodshed sessions that <laughs> I didn't particularly enjoy I had to try to sort of remind people about what being a team player requires. But it never lasted very long, the frictions, because people believed in the goal, because they were so compelled uh, by being part of this historic enterprise. But you do have to think hard as you're putting that together. Make sure that there's absolutely clear assignment of who has responsibility for what. So there's not treading on toes uh, where people say, hey, wait a minute, that was my job. You have to think a lot about the junior people in the team and make sure that their contribution is getting very much recognized. They're the most vulnerable ones. The senior professors, they'll be okay. But the junior people, you wanna be sure they're on a path that this is actually building for them credibility and not that they're gonna be seen as just some sort of technical support system that wasn't actually involved in the intellectual part. And we worked really hard on that uh, with the Genome Project. And I think it worked out really well. Uh, the junior people in that project all went on to great things and they had wonderful relationships and experiences that they could build on. You just have to really think about all of that. And then, yeah, you have to be prepared uh, to change direction uh, when new science comes along. And that's hard sometimes for a big complicated team uh, to reorient themselves. And not everybody's happy when they <laughs> hear that the uh, strategy is going to have to be rewritten, but that's part of the job of the leadership. I could go on a lot about this <laughs> because yeah. it has been my great privilege to be involved in a lot of these team efforts. But when they work well, it's an amazing experience. And along those lines, how have you remained steadfast in work that you pursued, whether it was the Human Genome Project or the search for the, the cause of cystic fibrosis? How have you maintained your commitment and enthusiasm? And then how have you maintained that for your team and helped mm -hmm. them stay committed and enthusiastic even when you have to shift direction or even when sort of the, the bad days, the frustrations come? I'm also fortunate that I have my own research group at NIH, which is not a big, complicated team, although we collaborate a lot with other people. It keeps me grounded in the reality of what's happening at the bench every day. You can lose track of that if you're the team leader for a big, complicated international project and you're several steps away from the actual work that's going on. And so it's really helpful for me uh, to be able to sit with a postdoc who just did an experiment that week and say, okay, what happened? Show me the data and tell me what you think you're gonna do next and let's talk about whether that's the right strategy. 
So being grounded that way in the reality uh, probably is a, is a helpful thing. Uh, my lab currently works on this extremely rare form of premature aging called progeria, uh, where we were able to find the cause of this. It's a single uh, letter of the DNA code that's misspelled in these kids, and they age at about seven times the normal rate, even though their brain development is normal. So here are kids who are trying to find their path in the world, oftentimes rather precociously, as their bodies are aging at this prodigious rate. And that has been uh, a 20 year obsession to try to come up with a strategy uh, of how to help them. And again, it's how do you sort of identify a new direction? For a while we were focused completely on drug therapy and we got to the point of an FDA approved drug uh, last uh, fall, which was a pretty big deal for a really rare disease, but it's not a cure. And now working with uh, an investigator uh, at the Broad Institute, you've shifted into doing a gene editing approach where you actually try to fix that letter that's wrong and uh, have managed in the mouse model to show that could actually work in a rather dramatic way with a single infusion of this base editor and are now figuring out how to bring that to FDA. It's a constant sort of moving of where's the strategy, where's the best partner, <laughs> uh, do we have the right expertise? If not, how do we find it uh, to try to keep things going? You, you sure don't want to get yourself locked into, okay, the next 10 years, I'm going to do this <laughs> because science these days is just not amenable to that kind of predictable course. And we should celebrate that. It's great. It's the best time imaginable to be doing creative science. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to use this question to then, after this question, I'll invite my colleagues to offer their own questions for you, Francis. But as we, um, and I'm shifting to the coronavirus, most of my questions focused on another topic, but as we look down the end of the road and, and more people are getting vaccinated and there's a lot of reason to hope, we as an institution are very aware that there are going to be long-term ramifications from a psychological and mental health or even a spiritual perspective. And I just was curious, about your thoughts with regard to what an institution like JTF should or could be doing to minister to the human soul as we come out of this crisis? Well, there are many things that we're all going to need help with. And JTF is in a place, I think, uh, to play a significant role in, in pursuing those. I just read an article this morning in Lancet Psychiatry uh, looking at uh, hundreds of thousands of COVID-19 survivors in the UK and trying to assess what the consequences are. And fully one third of those individuals, many months later, are, are still having psychiatric or mental health or neurological issues. And interestingly, particularly when it comes to persistent anxiety and depression, that doesn't seem to correlate with how sick they were uh, with COVID-19. The people who had mild illness and didn't go to the hospital have just about the same incidence uh, of this very significant long tail of anxiety, depression, um, and some of even frank psychoses uh, as a consequence of this. We don't understand this, and it is different than previous respiratory illnesses, which generally, when you got over them, you were over them. But with COVID-19, there is this long hauler phenomenon, which is not at all rare. We don't know to what extent that will be um, something that passes over time, that people will gradually recover from that, or whether they're going to need a lot more intervention. Nobody, as far as I know, has actually looked at the spiritual side of that to try to understand to what extent uh, these consequences arise from people who have come face to face with their mortality risks in a way that they hadn't before and are therefore in a bit of a spiritual desert of trying to figure out what's the meaning of life and why am I here and does God exist and does God, God care about me? That seems like that is a fertile area uh, for further investigation. Certainly we at NIH with our National Institute on Mental Health are going to be very focused on following up on what happens in this so-called long COVID syndrome. And we will do a lot of investigation about mechanisms and neuroscience, 
but I don't know that we will necessarily get as deeply into the spiritual part of this as we should, or as I would like to. We have this sort of government role, which I have to be aware sometimes puts a bit of a limit on how far down the path we go in looking at spiritual causes of physical and mental illnesses. And this is going to be a big deal. Uh, I mean, as awful as COVID has been, and it's been awful, and we've lost 550,000 people, it's even not going to be gone when it's gone. It's going to leave this residue of long-term consequences uh, for people that we didn't expect and for which we have to pull out every kind of stop we have to try to understand how to help those folks get back to where they were. Great, well, thank you for that. I would like to invite the JTF team to ask questions. I think the best and most efficient way to do this is to post them in the chat and then I will narrate them and curate them for Francis. So uh, 